Before we get started with today's podcast, we'd like to ask returning listeners to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you really enjoy it, share a link to this podcast with friends or family who would enjoy hearing our weekly discussions about basketball and basketball culture. Now, on to the show. Yeah, this is amazing. Welcome to the 199 podcast. We're revisiting some of the stories from the past couple of months. It's been our biggest two months, and I just want to thank everyone for listening. I think there's a few stories to pull out here that are just so much fun to re listen to, and it would be great for sharing as well over the holiday weekend. Uh, as, as we head into the deep parts of summer. But 19.9, if you haven't already, hasn't stopped uh, releasing things. Uh, they've got some awesome gear out there. Just had that big summer release. Uh, so check them out. I want to start with Jeff Hawkins, who played on some amazing Kansas teams. Um, I was thinking about this interview, and it made me think of the NBA, where we so often laud some of the teams that didn't quite make it over the hump. We think about the Blazers, who just fell short to Jordan and his Bulls, or those Utah Jazz teams with Carl Malone, Barkley, uh, Sacramento, who fell to the the Lakers team, or that even that Portland team with where Pippen in the later stages of his career. We do it a little bit in college basketball, but maybe not quite as much. And I think that the IU team where you lost Allen Henderson or the year before their undefeated team come to mind as an IU fan. I'm sure that there are others that you might be able to call to mind. But for Kansas, those two teams were so special. And the fact that they just fell short in the national championship, you know, a, a Hakeem Warwick block and, and just running into a, a bad night the year before maybe. Uh, where they could have had a championship in one of those years. And I think hearing Jeff Hawkins talk about that is just so much fun, and it's fun to relive, relive the players on those teams. So let's let's listen to a little bit of the Chuckers interview with Jeff Hawkins uh, about those Kansas teams. That's a second consecutive Final Four for the Jayhawks. And, and I'm curious, from your perspective, what was different about heading down to New Orleans in 2003 compared to the previous season in Atlanta when you guys actually fell to Maryland, which we mentioned earlier, what was different about this second trip to the Final Four compared to the first? Ah, uh, shoot. Ah, uh, man. It was, I mean, if you could just see, like, how I'm smiling right now, it's just like, Jesus, <laughs> it's like so much, like, it was just like, I don't know, man. Like, describing the feeling is, is crazy because it was just like everything was so much better. Um, and obviously, you know, we knew, all right, we, we got to the Final Four, We've been there, you know, pretty much we were, you know, one of the favorites to, to win it. But everything just seemed a little bit different because we were just there the last year. So we were kind of coming in like, all right, we know how things are going to work. Security was a little bit crazier. In our first game, I think uh, uh, we got, I mean, the, just having the police escorts to practice. I mean, like everything was just magnified to a whole nother level. Uh, just the fans, you know, every, I mean – it's just a great experience when you can get to the final four. It's it's really an unbelievable feeling. I mean, I you know, obviously every team goes there to try to win it, but being there back to back is it's a it's a crazy feeling. It's a crazy feeling that something that I always cherish for the rest of my life, but it was it was it was just different in so many ways because everything was just amped up a little bit more because we saw how it was the year before and it was already amped up because it was the final four, but we were here for a second time. So things were just a little bit more magnitude, uh, just on a little bit more of a, a bigger yeah. but Great memories, man. Yeah. Oh, we should all be able to go to final fours. Yeah. Uh, so I wish the whole guys, world experienced that. Yeah. You know, you guys, uh, you guys face Marquette and Dwayne Wade um, and Dwayne Wade you know, one of the greatest basketball performances, yeah. probably the 21st century. He just yeah. takes it to Kentucky to get yeah. to the final four, bring Marquette into the final four, yeah. drops a triple, triple double on the Wildcats national title game spot on the line against Marquette. And you guys smack them. I mean, you guys hang 59 on Marquette in the first half, you win 94, 61. What went so well in that game? Man, just every, I mean, 
everything was kicking. I think uh, I'd have to. I go mean, back. just sitting there watching that, are you like, my yeah. God, I can't believe we're smacking someone like this in the final yeah. four? Yeah. Well, you know I me. Mean? I'm like, well, like I said, like the minutes I got, like I, you know, I I got minutes. You know, I would sub in for Aaron to give him breaks or you know, quick boom, boom, boom. You know, um, that would be. I knew I would get in at some point in time in the game to relieve Aaron to give him a quick breather so he can get back in after a TV timeout. I kind of knew when I was going in with with Coach Williams. That's kind of how he was. You knew when you were going in. So in the first half, I'm looking like, whoa. I was like, man, I might get like 10 whole minutes in this <laughs> In the final <laughs> four, so like the way the game's going, I'm just sitting there like, man, but everything was clicking. Like, I mean, everything, everything was clicking. Uh, I mean, when when we got Eric, you know, Aaron Miles is obviously known for breaking down his defenders, creating plays. Uh, but I think a Miles was hitting threes. Everybody was just everything was clicking. I mean, I, I, that's all I can say. We play that national championship game like that. Everything was clicking. Like there's nothing that could stop us that night. And obviously, we were playing against a, a, a Dwayne Wade, a great Dwayne Wade, who when we first saw him on. Scout report. I mean, all their all the Marquette clips that we watched were, you know, it was ah, oh, this player can do this, this player can do that, and then like the ninety percent of the rest of the clips were Dwayne Wade, and we're just looking at all of the clips, and I'm like, this dude looks like a mini Michael Jordan, just like running down the court, just huh, dunk here, steal here, shot here, fade away. I'm like, oh man. So we came in the game like, oh man. This is gonna be a good game, and obviously, you know, um, we were able to to counter some things on our end and and be able to shut him down and and and, and be able to have that that type of a, a lead and a win and get a win. Yeah, you know, it's always great when you have those games where man, the ball just goes in the hoop constantly. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. everyone's in it, and so you guys are opposite Syracuse for the national title. Um, I'm curious, you know, we talked about that Duke game. Uh, and what stands out for you about the Duke game is not the actual game. It's you getting the green, the green light in practice. So yeah. as you guys kind of, you know, you got this Saturday win against Marquette Monday is the national title game. What stands out in the lead up to that national title game? Was there something the day before a walkthrough, a dinner, maybe the locker room before tip off? What, what just kind of sticks in your mind is something you'll kind of never forget from kind of the, the lead up to that national title game. Uh, whew. I mean, I just, from what I remember, man, like, and to be honest, that's a really great question because I really never had to kind of tap in, never had a question like that, you know, the mood on on that. I've had so many questions about all my Final Four trips. That, I mean, I've never had that one, so this is kind of getting me thinking. But, you know, our mood was, you know, it was just kind of lax. You know, we kind of – Maybe you could say two lags. You we maybe thought like, man, this is, man, this is our it's it's ours to lose type. You know that's kind of the that's kind of the feeling that we had. Like it's ours to lose. Like and um, I mean that's to me what really sticks out because there was no 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 added pressure. You know we really felt like you know we we should have been in this situation even from when we you know started out in that that three game losing streak. You know, we said, you know, we still thought this is the, the spot that we're supposed to be in. Yeah. And we were just, everybody was laser focused, still laser focused, but just in a lax mood, just like, you know, we, this is, we can, we can see that it's right here. Yeah. And I got to imagine you went in the game with kind of real strong confidence coming off that Marquette game too. So, yeah, you know, we've had uh, two others join us on the 199 podcast, Jason Andreas from Michigan State and David Nelson from Georgia Tech. And the one question I love asking guys is, hey, tell me about a guy that an opponent you would play and you looked at and were like, yo, man, that dude is from another planet. Like, that dude is sick. And both of them, without hesitation, said Carmelo. Did you see it too? Yeah. Did you have that feeling like, man, this dude is from another planet? Or were you like, no, that's a good ball player, but I've seen better. Or was it like, no, man, that dude's something different. Yeah, Carmelo's Carmelo, man. Like, I mean, Hall of Famer, All Star, stud. But to me, to me, it was Dwayne Wade. Like, to me, it was Dwayne Wade. Like, when we saw this dude in film, like I told you, it's like, it was just like, man, this dude looking like my IMJ. Like his mannerisms, the way he was moving, and he was like his, he was 
doing fadeaways. Smooth, I mean, man. Yeah. yeah, it would be very smooth. So it was just like, man, this dude right here. But then you see a young, but again, this is a young Carmelo Anthony. Young Carmelo, fearless, fearless Carmelo Anthony. Just like this Carmelo was the guy that, I mean, he was carrying himself as if he was, as if he was a senior or even a fifth year senior, like Carmelo, that's the way he carried himself. So you just knew like, man, this, this, this guy can hoop. He can go inside, outside. He can hit you with the three ball. Like he can do it all. He can do it all. So, but to me, it was, it was, it was just Dwayne Wade, no knock to, to, uh, to Melo, but don't get me wrong. Melo's right up there too. Like, Trust me, it was a game changer. Well, I gotta imagine some of the clips you were seeing of Wade were from that Kentucky game, which yeah. was I mean, just an all-time <laughs> individual effort, man. I mean, yeah, uh, Wade, Chicago's very own, where the Chuckers yeah, from, yeah, for and, sure, and he's for sweet. Sure. And so that's um, you know that that game against Cuse, man, that is a memorable game for college basketball fans. The Orange jump out on you guys; they're up fifty-three forty-two at the half. But ironically, it's not Melo that's the star of that first half. It's another freshman named Jerry McNamara. Yeah. So take us into that halftime locker room. Um, you guys, you thought you you guys could win the national title. You believed you could win the national title. You're down nine at the ha- or eleven at the half. What was that locker room like? What do you recall about that locker room? It was uh, it was just it was just a, a whole different type of focus, you know, um, just like from a mindset where like, man, like you can see it. We're like, dude, if we don't step it up, we're going to lose this game type deal. And like, we're done. And not only are we done, not, not like we just lost in the the sweet 16, trying to make it to the sweet 16 second round, even in the final four, like this is for it all right now. It's like, is this is how, is this how we're trying to go out type deal? Like it was a real quiet locker room. It was a it was a real quiet locker room, you know, but you could see the focus on on everybody. You know, obviously, you know, Kirk and Nick, you know, they're gonna say some things. There's some guys mumble jumbling some things. Um, but for the for the most part, you know, it was man, we're we're almost like we're sitting there just waiting for Coach Williams to come in and figure out what we gotta do as players. Almost like we're just players sitting in there like, all right, we gotta wait for our coach to see what what the next game plan, and then we're ready to dive in and execute it to whatever it's like as players we're just like okay what do you got for us coach type deal so and and that's a good point does Williams come in with like fire and brimstone or is he like hey boys this is what we're gonna do and is it very kind of um you know just kind of shouting out some directives that he knows that here's what we need to do we execute this we're gonna be fine or was it what the hell are you guys doing let's go you know what what do you recall about his demeanor yeah you know from what I recall obviously it was you know his demeanor was his demeanor was uh, more mellow. Trust me, I've been in some 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 locker rooms when they haven't been, but you know his hit it, it was it was more like, hey guys, we we kind of put ourselves in a situation, read the you know reading the stats, you know figuring out what we got to do better, and like, hey, it's, it's going out there. You know, I think that's the cool thing about Coach Coach uh, Williams. You know, his ability to adapt um, in game situations on the fly and. You know, he could care, he could tell right now at that time, probably not the time to, you know, really just start beating up on guys. Obviously, you know, hey, we got to go. You, you know, we know we got to go, but he's not he's not really getting on, on guys too, too, too hard right then because he knows he needs everybody together and mentally strong to get to get through this, especially in a national championship game. Yeah. And, you know, Cuse, you know, after being up 11 at the half, they maintain a kind of comfy lead. Uh, they're up 12 with five minutes to go. So, I mean, they're, they've kind of taken, they've kind of yeah. seeded control of this game. They they got it. But you guys kind of claw back in and you cut it to three with a minute to go. And Q's really seem to be kind of backpedaling. They're reeling, man. As you are sitting there, Jeff Hawkins, Jayhawk, what are you thinking? Like, yeah, we got this. I mean, what, or are you thinking like, all right, we're almost there. Are you nervous? Are you excited? Just what do you, what are your feelings sitting there watching this all unfold in front of you? and being a really vested player in this, you know? Well, you know, at that time, you know, you got, we have, at that time, we're, you know, you said being, being down 12 or five minutes, you just like, man, in a national championship game against a great team. Um, you know, at that time on the bench, you're just like, man, you just like, man, I hope we got this. I hope we got this. I hope we got this. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. And then the lead stars, obviously 
getting a little bit closer, then you're just like, yeah, man, like now that's what we're talking about. We got this. We got this. And obviously, it, you know, it went down to the it went down to the wire. We had two shots at the end to to you know try to get a uh, try to tie for for overtime. And um, you know, it, it it was just one of those deals where we're like, man, we we're gonna have another shot once we get our shot. The shot that we've been looking for, we're gonna take it and just run with it. And we just couldn't get over we couldn't get over that hump. You know, and obviously so, everyone, you know, free throws, free throws killed us that game. Free throws killed us. Yeah. That game. I think that's such a fun story to listen back to. You know, he says something, and what I love about these interviews is how they take us behind the scenes into the locker room and talks about Coach Williams there in the locker room, his approach to things, the way he can make in-game adjustments. And they talk about the players as leaders. That's such a discounted factor these days where it's so important for the them to be able to step into that void and maybe to bridge that gap between what the the coach is saying and get it to turn it into action on the court and to to motivate not just themselves from what the coach says, but to motivate the rest of the team as as well. The next interview that we've got coming up here uh, to look back on is from Sammy Gannell. He was the he's the slam archivist. And I, I heard about this when doing some research on Dennis Page, which I'd love to have him on and get a chance to, to talk to him. He's the founder of Slam and Slam is such an influential influential document in the history of basketball. Now, I just heard even uh, Larry Johnson was on the Knuckleheads podcast talking about being on the, the cover of Slam, the first cover, and he was uh, reminiscing, thinking about that people know that about him over so many other things. Like, you were the first cover of Slam magazine. It's almost the first thing that's brought up to him. And, you know, he's got all these crazy career accomplishments, and to have that as the, as the first thing that people say to him demonstrates, I think, just how important Slam is to the history of basketball. And what Sammy is doing is archiving uh, that, that, uh, and, and preserving it for future generations to check out and, and his story here and, and how he got involved is a, a good example of how anyone could get involved, uh, with the game of basketball, even if they're, you know, not, not a player coach, it's just another way to, to become part of the community. So I think it's fun. Uh, let's take a listen back to, to Sammy telling how he got started with it. Nice. I want to get into though, a little bit of how, how I, I came to find you because that's a funny story. And then I want to hear just kind of how you came up with the idea to start doing what you're doing. So uh, I was watching this interview with Dennis Page, uh, founder of, of Slam, and he's talking about Slam and about the cover of Slam. And he starts talking about uh, their digital presence, and he just name drops you and and talks about, uh, he's like, this guy, he's just putting all of slam on, you know, on, on Instagram. And I'm, and I was just like, hold on what? And he was so enthusiastic about it and excited about it. And I love that approach. Cause it's kind of how the NBA has gone to, you know, they'll let people clip up games and, and use that because it's, you know, like a commercial, right? You get to see it and it doesn't, you know, those are the b- biggest fans, the ones that are looking at pages like that. But I'm just curious, where'd you get the idea? And, and then, and then how did you, how did you kind of start to put it together? Well, I about probably six years ago, I began kind of just digging out my old kind of collection of stuff. So I had loads of NBA jerseys and I had loads of magazines and all sorts. And um, I guess kind of a long story short is that I began kind of selling some of my old stuff, but then noticing how much some of it could go for on eBay or whatever. <laughs> and so no kidding, probably more even now today. It's true. And then probably noticing then when other people were, were under, under selling their stuff. So buying things mm-hmm. and reselling. Um, and then I kind of, I grew, I started putting stuff on Instagram because then I kind of tapped into this whole community of basketball fans who sold everything from like old school jerseys um, game worn jerseys and then things like trading cards, the old NBA videotapes. And so I, I just began kind of tapping into that, that community. There's loads of guys in the Europe, in, in Europe and in the UK as well, um, who, who are part of that community as well. And, um, yeah, I guess I, I started kind of building and kind of making links through that. I, and then I put together a pop-up shop, um, in the UK nice. in 2017 in London, uh, which was really cool. And, um, 
I'd kind of through Instagram been able to, you know, one of the major people that was amazing for me to connect with was Slam. Um, and in, initially it started informally in that they were running something at the time called uh, a hashtag called Slam Hoops. Okay. Yeah. So people would just sh- share nice pictures of courts, maybe their local court, wherever, and hashtag Slam, slam Hoops and they would reshare it. And uh, basically I was, I was using the hashtag like, all the time because, you know, I loved Slam. And then one day they were like, that they got to drop me a DM and were like, we'd love to repost your pic, send us an email. And I was just like, I, I probably emailed something like, this is the greatest day of my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, that Slam, Slam has got in touch with me. And so this yes. picture was, was amongst all this other stuff that I was doing in terms of jersey collecting and stuff like that. So when I did this pop-up shop, I'd kind of built a bit of a relationship with them off the back of that. And I... Um, they kind of informally partnered with me on the on the shop and allowed me to put up uh, do a whole display wall of of slam covers, which was really really cool. And then uh, a bit later down the line, I had like a permanent shop, um, a, a kind of semi semi permanent sh- shop uh, here in London uh, that continued going. Uh, but then that kind of phased out. And I was at a place where I'd built kind of a decent following on this Instagram page with old school basketball stuff. And I was thinking, what can I do next? And I thought, well, I've got, you know, I want to stay engaged. I want to stay connected with this community. And so I thought slam is one of my favorite things that I have. It's my my favorite part of basketball history. I reckon I've, I've, I've got more or less at least the first 50 issues. um, And most of even the old, alternate covers within those 50 issues as well oh wow okay so i thought let me start posting them and documenting them and so i did and i kind of did it in a way where it was quite thorough um the cover the adverts and then also the uh the content within as well and just from the get-go it just was getting really amazing engagement so dennis page was um was all over it and Ben Osborne, uh, one of the former editors as well, he was just really kind of showing it a lot of love. And then Tony Giovino, one of the original editors, um, who I, I, I again I was fortunate to meet him in London like a few a few years back. He dropped a comment and he said, "I'll do you a deal if you tag me in every cover that I am uh, that I edited. I will just uh, I will share any anecdotes." any ad- anecdotes I have in the comment section. Yes. And so cool. all of that just went towards it, kind of really just gaining a lot of interest and a lot of uh, engagement. Um, so that's kind of how it all started, really. Um, and then, yeah, it kind of it, it got official a little bit later after that. You can hear in his voice still how excited he was to become an official part of Slam's uh, documentation. But it just started with an idea and with uh, recognition and just a passion for basketball. And that's what it ends up being all about is uh, finding ways to connect with the history, to tell the story. That's something that 99 tries to do. It's not just a pair of shorts, which, which look cool. It's the story behind them and sharing that with a, a larger community that makes things so much fun. Uh, The last story here that we're going to hit on today and the last of our best of uh, episodes for right now is from Mike Cleansing. He played at Kent State and runs a podcast called the Hoop Heads Podcast, which you should check out as well. Uh, He tells a story about visiting IU and getting to play at at Assembly Hall. And he's got a a funny story about an interaction with one of the IU players that I think is worth revisiting. I just want to thank everyone again for uh, joining us in, uh, in revisiting some of these stories. And we'll be back with new episodes really soon. For right now, let's check out Mike and his story from visiting Assembly Hall. Hey, what do you remember Absolutely. about, uh, I saw him there too. Did you, do you remember going to IU or Indiana in 8990, uh, playing Absolutely. at Assembly Hall? Tell sure. me about, tell so me about a, that. Okay, so I got I got a bunch of good stories from, from that trip. So yes. first thing is, we get into Indiana the night before. So we drive, I forget what day the game was in, but we usually, we usually got on the bus and bus out there, bus out there the night before. So we bus out, we get into Indiana, like around dinner time. Indiana's finishing up their, their practice. And then we're getting the floor after Indiana. So the first thing that you notice when you walk into the floor, at, uh, into assembly hall at that time is all the chairs are bolted to the floor. <laughs> yes. So they they literally underneath. No the bench, coincidence there. They they had right. They had these metal like metal <laughs> clamps 
that were in the floor. And then the, the chairs had like a, an old, <laughs> like if you think of like a bike lock yeah. that ran through all the chairs and through these clamps. So obviously Bobby <laughs> Knight couldn't pick up another chair and chuck it across the floor. <laughs> and then Bob Knight was there and I had never seen Bob Knight in person before. Uh-huh. And Bob Knight is a much, much bigger individual yeah. than I would have ever imagined seeing him on TV. I mean, he's like six, four, maybe six, five, yeah. just a big person. So big seeing big. him in person, somebody that you'd seen on TV so often and just seeing him there. And I didn't have any personal interaction with him other than just kind of seeing him for 10 or 12 feet away. Right. And he was just bigger than I remember. That's, <laughs> that's the, the overwhelming memory I have of Bobby Knight is just that he was bigger and that, Hey, the chairs are bolted to the floor. <laughs> so those were sort of the two pre, those are the two, two pregame things I noticed. Yeah. Then during the game behind the baskets at assembly hall, they have all the banners. Of course. And while you're, sh- while you're shooting or while, I mean, I'm assuming it's going on all the time, but I noticed when I was shooting free throws, those banners go like this yeah. because of, I don't know if it's yeah. the air conditioning system or it whatever, yeah. but the banners go, banners go side <laughs> to side. So you're up there shooting free throws <laughs> and it's like, you know, you're looking at the baskets kind of baskets kind of moving. So I yeah. remember, I remember that. And then I don't remember if I told you guys this story when you guys were on, but at the time when we played Indiana, Lawrence Funderburg, who was actually an Ohio guy that he transferred out of Indiana, probably shortly after they played against us, but he was probably a top 10 recruit in the country, Definitely. really a big time player. Yeah. And so we're playing this game and this is in the first half at some point. And there's a timeout. And so we're crossing. Lawrence Funderbrook and I are crossing. I'm going to my bench this way, and he's coming to his bench across this way. And he stops, and he goes up, and he grabs me like this. <laughs> and he goes, and then he just keeps walking to the bench. And I'm like. That's the weirdest thing. I turn around. I'm like, I'm like I, I couldn't even, you know, you're, you're like, what? I couldn't even, I, I was like, what just happened? Oh my and then gosh. at some point later in the game, he did it again. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? And he just kind of looked at me. He's like, so after the game, <laughs> so we're in the locker room. And we and we, we it was a close game, by the way. We lost, I think, by we lost by maybe I don't know, seven, That's eight, a good somewhere showing. in there. Yeah, that was, we a, were, that was a we good were, team. Yeah. And we were in the right. They had they had Greg Graham and yep. Eric Anderson, and they had they they were good. Um and I get in the locker room after the game. And one of my teammates goes, Hey man, you know, you got, you got fuzz from the, from your towel all over your face. Cause I had like a scruffy, you know, whatever. Oh yeah. Beard. Yeah. yeah. So there was all this white fuzz. I went in the bathroom, like there's all this white fuzz. Over <laughs> oh my, face. my God. So Funder, Funderbird so was, trying to get that. He was he was plucking fuzz <laughs> off of my he's face. He's trying to help you out. Were, he wants you on I said, TV. I guess he was trying to, he was yeah. trying to intimidate me and help me out all, at, uh, <laughs> you know, all, all at once. I love so, it. So yeah, that was, that was a fun, I mean, that was a fun experience. Thank you for listening to the 19.9 podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do. And while you're at it, leave us a rating or review. Five stars only, like the basketball camp. We also have links to all of 19.9 social media so you never miss a release. Until next time, 